Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com. Website creation is hard. Was hard, but not anymore. Thanks to Wondersuite from Bluehost. Answer a few questions about your business and goals, and the Wondersuite tool will automatically create your website or store. From there, you can customize your design, colors, and content, and we automatically help you get found in search engines like Google and Bing. From step-by-step guidance to suggested plugins, Bluehost makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Go to bluehost.com slash wondersuite. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Stephanie Nothell. The story was recorded in September 2013 at Littlefield in Brooklyn as part of a partnership with Everyday Health. The theme of the evening was aging. The story that I want to tell you starts in 2007. It was the summer after I had finished my first year in medical school. And that summer, I was actually in Baltimore. I was doing a research project on vascular risk factors of dementia. I'll spare you the details of that. But um, I remember there was one day in particular where I had spent basically the whole day staring at my computer screen. And at the end of the day, I had one of those horrible computer headaches where I just couldn't look at anything anymore. And I was on my way home, and I was walking through the medical campus, and I stopped at uh, one of the nursing homes on campus because I was planning on spending a couple hours visiting with one of the older folks that otherwise didn't have a lot of visitors that day. And before I go on, you might be wondering why I, in my early 20s, would spend my summer evening with some old person I had never met before. And the best way to explain that is to tell you a little bit about the first old people I met, my Oma and Opa. My grandparents lived in Germany because my parents are both from Germany. They had come originally in the 60s. They were only supposed to stay for nine months, but they're still here. So when I grew up, I didn't get to spend that much time with my grandparents because they were so far away. And so we would go maybe once, twice a year if we were lucky. Sometimes they would come to the U.S., Um, And every time we went, I was a pretty terrible packer, as one of my friends in the audience can attest. I always forget something really obvious, like underwear or pajamas. But um, when I was little, there was one thing that I always, always remembered when we went to Germany, and it was this small wooden box. It was called my stink box, or my stinkdose in German. (laughs) It was an oval, and it fit perfectly in the palm of my hand, and my opa had made it, um, and he covered it in pink velvet, and it had this white ribbon across the top that had little brown teddy bears on it. Anyway, so as soon as we would get to Germany and we were in their apartment, I would get out my stinkdose, and I would run over to my opa, who was always smoking a cigar, um, and he would exhale a big mouthful of smoke into my box and I would trap it in the box as fast as I could and then I would run across the apartment and I would find my Oma or my mom or whatever unsuspecting victim I could find and I would open the box up in their face and the smoke would go up their nose and I would laugh and we would do it for hours (laughs) and it was great and I obviously didn't know anything about secondhand smoke But um, as the years went on, I still did my stinkdose gig. Um, But the visits got a little bit more sparse because I was older and I had all these crazy after-school activities that I thought were so important. And my Oma and Oprah were getting older and it was really hard for them to make the trip across the Atlantic. Um, So we didn't see each other quite as much. And then when I was in high school, unfortunately, um, my Opa passed away. And... I remember I always thought that my Oma and Opa were an awesome team, but I didn't really appreciate it until my Opa passed away because then I started to realize how much he had really compensated for my Oma, who was beginning to show the signs of early dementia. 
So she started to do the classic things. She'd leave the stove on when she left the house. She forgot all the ingredients to her famous apfelstrudel recipe that she'd been making for 50 years. Um, you'd talk to her on the phone, and five minutes into the conversation, she would ask you why you were talking about what you were talking about. So after a lot of discussion, we decided that the best thing to do was to put her in a nursing home, which was a really hard decision because she'd been living in that same apartment for 50 years. That was the apartment that they moved into when they escaped the Russians in East Germany and made it to West Germany with my mom when she was two years old. So I felt really terrible. I, I realized that I, I somehow always thought there would be more time to spend with them when I was growing up. Uh, and now I was faced with the reality that there was less time than ever to spend with her. So I felt horrible, and one day I was out for a run, and I came up with what I thought was the absolute perfect solution, which was there was some girl, she lives in Germany, and she'll go visit my Oma in the nursing home. And in exchange, I'll visit her Oma, or Grandma, in America. The only problem is that I didn't actually know anybody like this. So I just started volunteering in nursing homes, and I just hoped that fate would figure out all the details for me. Um, so I started volunteering in my local nursing home in uh, high school, and it turns out that I just loved it. I loved everybody's grandparents almost as much as I love my open opa. So this is why, in 2007, on a nice summer evening when I could have gone out to the bar, I was stopping at the nursing home on campus in Baltimore. So I remember that night I went up to the nursing station like I always did, because I always want to ask, you know, who otherwise wouldn't get a visitor? And the medical assistant brought me to this room that had two demented older ladies that didn't have any nearby family. Uh, their names were Susie and Mabel. And when I walked into the room, Susie was curled up on her bed. She was an old Greek woman, and I remember she had a very thin figure. She had very pale, fragile skin and sparse gray hair. She was so pale that she like, almost was camouflaged by her white blanket. And um, she was looking around the room, and when I walked in, her eyes wandered, wandered over and saw me, and she gave me the biggest toothless grin I had ever seen, and it immediately made me smile. It still makes me smile thinking about it. She just had one of those faces where her wrinkles seemed to like fold right around her smile in the best way, um, like she had been happy her whole life, which is the reason why wrinkles are really awesome. Um, <laughs> and to her left was her roommate, Mabel. She was wearing this bright pink t-shirt, and she had cards, playing cards scattered all over the table in front of her. Like She was trying really hard to play solitaire, but her dementia precluded her from remembering the details of exactly how to play that game. So I look over at Mabel, and, and Mabel says, hello, and I say hello, and we actually hadn't really gotten much further than that when Susie, the Greek woman, all of a sudden announces, I die today. And I was like, what? And I look around the room thinking maybe I heard her wrong, there's someone else I can ask, but it's just me and Mabel, and Mabel looks at me and she just smiles. So I'm like, okay, I can, I can go with this. And I just keep talking to Mabel, but Susie persists, and she says, I died today, coffee? And I think, what? <laughs> And at this point, I'm starting to get a little nervous. My heart's starting to beat really fast. And so I do what any good medical student would do, and I look for help. So I go out in the hallway, and I'm looking down for a nurse. I look the other way, and there's nobody. So I think, OK, I can do this. What did I learn in my first year of medical school? And there was nothing that was helpful. So I just go back in, and I go up to Susie, and I say, hi, you know, what's going on? How can I help you? And she looks at me with the most longing eyes, and she says, coffee? Please, please, coffee? I died today. Susie died today. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what, what do I do? And I must have looked like a deer in headlights. I had no idea what to tell this poor Greek woman. So luckily, the nurse walks in within the next couple of seconds. 
And I say to her, so uh, I think Susie wants some coffee. Um, can we get her some coffee? And the nurse says, oh, d did she pull that thing on you where she tells you she's going to die? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, maybe you could have warned me about that. Um, and she's like, oh, she does that all the time. She has this condition. She can only have one cup of coffee. She's had her cup of coffee, and she knows that. And I think, oh, okay, all right. She's like, why don't you just go and talk to Mabel? She puts down the water that she brought into the room, and she leaves. And so I'm still feeling really uncomfortable with this whole situation because this woman is threatening death for coffee, and I feel like <laughs> I really like coffee. Maybe I could just get her some. What's the big deal? But I do what I'm told, and I go over, and I hang out with Mabel. But honestly, I felt so terrible about the whole thing. I, I don't even think I stayed in the room for like five more minutes because I was so scared that Susie was going to say something again. And I just, I didn't want to have to deal with that. So I cut the visit short and I went home. And for the rest of the week, it really kind of bothered me. You know, this poor woman that just wanted more coffee and I couldn't give it to her. I tried to think about conditions I'd learned about in medical school that would preclude you from getting coffee and... Anyways, about a week later, I was on campus, and I was in another building, and I was walking down the hallway, and I saw one of the geriatricians who I knew was working in the nursing home on campus, and I almost didn't say hi because I was really nervous. I was just a medical student, and, you know, she's a geriatrician. But when we stopped in the hallway to say hello, I brought up the only thing that I knew we had in common, which was the nursing home, and so I asked about Susie and Mabel. And she said, oh, didn't you know? Susie passed away. And I, I don't remember the rest of that conversation. I probably looked like an idiot in front of this woman. Because I just had this horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like, what had I done? I thought about Susie's face with that big smile and how happy she must have been. And I pictured her somewhere in Greece, you know, welcoming people into her home. I thought about her Greek granddaughter that I probably totally disappointed by not giving her grandmother a cup of coffee. And I thought about my Oma. I have this beautiful memory of my Oma, one of her last Christmases in the nursing home. I went with my mom and, and her sisters, and we gave my Oma this small glass of Eierlikur, which is a German eggnog. And never mind that you're not supposed to give alcohol to demented people. My Oma got more life from that little glass of iron liqueur than she got from any dementia medication we ever gave her. And you know, why, why didn't this woman get that same opportunity? So that's been years, and now I'm lucky enough to call myself a physician. And I think about that all the time. I think about, about Susie and how I'm constantly faced with these older adults that have tons of chronic medical conditions, and each one comes with a list of do's and don'ts, and the guideline says give this medication, and this guideline says get the, that medication. And when you put it all together, they all end up conflicting each other. And so it takes really a lot of mindful skill to get through that, and it's a skill that I'm definitely still perfecting, but one that I think that Susie's toothless grin uh, definitely sharpened more than any other experience I've had. Thanks so much. That was Stephanie Nothel. Stephanie is an internal medicine resident at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. She's an aspiring geriatrician and has spent many hours volunteering in nursing homes and previously worked in an adult daycare center before attending medical school. She currently does research on cardiovascular risk factors and development of dementia. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Speaking of those, we're coming soon to Pittsburgh and London. And October 8th, come out to Brooklyn for our first experiment with Story Collider video. Again, all of that is at storycollider.org. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, to Everyday Health for being wonderful partners, and to Chance for having us do a show on aging on my birthday. Thanks for listening.
Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.